before the City Girls would be twerking with Cardi B on a yacht, before they would get the attention of Drake and be a part of his number one hit In My Feelings, before they would sign to Quality Control, and before they would have over 300k subscribers on YouTube and over 1 million followers on Instagram, the City Girls had an astronomical rise to fame and it came all from authenticity. The two women decided to start rapping as a joke when they went to a studio to make a diss track towards some local Miami women, but after turning the song into a female empowerment anthem, they started to gain some local buzz. They performed at strip clubs and gained an online following, even getting the attention of one of the biggest music execs in the business. And after dropping their debut project, a pretty well-known Canadian rapper reached out for them to do a song together. And the craziest part is, all of this happened in the span of less than a year. Young Miami of the City Girls said, we wanna be a miracle. We want everyone to believe it can happen to them because we really are just regular girls. What's going on good people in the comments section? I hope you're having one heck of a day. My name is Jeremy Hecht here for you on Before They Were Famous, taking you through the life and career of City Girls prior to fame. If you haven't watched some of the newer videos, I'm the LA host for this channel and I'll be doing weekly content to help out Michael, whose schedule is crazy. We've also done recent profiles on people like Future, Shoreline Mafia, and Saweetie, as well as some epic Before They Were Famouses on Ariana Grande, Cardi B, Drake, and more. So be sure to check those out after you finish watching this video. In the meantime, in between time, if there's anybody we should cover, let us know in the comments down below. You can let me know on Instagram, my link will be below. Send me your request, but without any more talk, let's get into the video. Hey, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell. Boom! The City Girls consist of two members, Young Miami, born Carisha Brownlee on February 11, 1994 in Miami, Florida, and JT, born Jatavia Johnson on December 3, 1992 in Liberty City, Florida. I'm still, I still live there, and I don't want to leave there. Well, bye. I'll call you on FaceTime when I leave there because I don't want to live there. I'll be right there. Growing up, Young Miami told Rolling Stone that her childhood was basically an adulthood. In the City Girls documentary, she said that she grew up in a rough neighborhood that wasn't exactly the beautiful Miami you picture when you think of the city. She says there was everything from fights happening regularly outside her apartment complex to them having fun running around outside during hurricanes. To me, that's more scary than fun, but I can't see the appeal. JT and Miami have been friends since their early teen years, but the story of how they actually met changes basically in every interview they do. Whether they connected off of MySpace, were both popular and had heard of each other through the city, they knew each other's cousins and best friends, they spent time at each other's grandmother's houses. I don't know, it's not exactly clear how they first met, but those are the best kinds of friendships. Where you don't really remember how someone came into your life, but you can't remember what your life was like without them. We got history together. Like, my friends is literally my family. Cause you know this a girl thing, we gotta stick together. Either way, they both went to middle school together in Miami, where they would go out at night and party at teen clubs until two o'clock in the morning. But JT didn't just cap it at teen clubs, she was sneaking into strip clubs by the time she was 17. My mom never let me go to those teen clubs back in Winnipeg, Canada, but looking back on it, I'm kind of thankful cause Thinking about the owners of those teen clubs, they were probably pretty creepy. And the whole idea of it kind of seems weird looking back on it, but Young Miami's mom was friends with Trick Daddy, was around Rick Ross, and Trina is Young Miami's longtime family friend and is actually her godmother, so she might have had a bit more street cred than my mom. Sorry, mom. Miami says that Trina helped raise her and she told XXL, all I can remember is always going to the fair with her when it came around every year and there'd be bodyguards. Everybody running up to her like, can I take a picture? This music that's dominant, this powerful, and as a woman, you have to have so much determination and so much willpower and so much confidence that you really don't give a shit about what anybody else thinks. Trina has become a mentor and gives the two advice, but at first, neither one of them wanted to be a rapper. JT's father had a studio in their house and wanted his kids to become rappers, but apparently none of them really had any bars, so JT would have to write everyone's raps. And he used to make me sit in there and write all their raps, and I was like, oh, no, I don't want to be no rapper. I never thought about rapping on nothing. Until like last year, August, that's when I thought of it. Miami always knew she wanted a lavish lifestyle, but never pictured her money coming in from rap. Both Miami and JT learned the hustling game from their mothers, who always dated wealthy men and taught them how to finesse for what they want. Young Miami's mom told her to never talk to a man who can't do anything for you. Not bad advice. 
Unfortunately, Miami's mother went to jail a couple of years ago, and Miami says that was one of the hardest things that she's ever had to face. You made me a woman. Mm. And that's how I learned how to deal with like a lot of things that I go through now. It just made me strong. JT said that her first car in high school was bought for her by a boy who spent his income tax check on new wheels for the city girl. After teaching him how to file his taxes, he bought her an Ultima Coupe with the return. And I guess the girls are really living their raps because on the song Period, she says, I call my last dude Monopoly. I effed him so good I owned a few properties. But it wasn't just taking money from dudes. The two women were always bossed up themselves. JT said she always had a job working at various places from Whole Foods to Burger King. She just wanted more. And who can be mad at her for that? In high school, JT began rapping for fun and was in a rap group with her friends called Pretty Bitches Bang Pink. Great name. One day she just called me and was like, Carisha, let's do this song. I got these two beats, let's rap. And I'm like, girl, like, what the f Like, I ain't no rapper, what you? I'm like, no. After playing her the beat with her finished verse and begging her to get on the song, finally Miami put her verse on. Young Miami grew up listening to Jeezy and a lot of trap music in the car while her boyfriend drove her to school. And of course, she would listen to her godmother, Trina. While JT had more of an affinity for gospel music like Yolanda Adams and Kirk Franklin. At first, the two just wanted to use rap to record a diss track in 2017 towards some girls in their city after getting into some beef. They contacted their friend and producer Major 9 and bought a beat that sampled My Neck, My Back, and they recorded the track F That Dude. But the song ended up becoming more of an independent women and, well, broke boy bashing anthem than a diss track to any girls in particular. In an interview with Hot New Hip Hop, they told you how to spot a broke boy. Dirty fingernails. If your nails is dirty, mm -mm. sound of broke. Okay, so I think I'm clear on number one. What else we have? Two, how loud you talk. A lot of niggas be broke talking loud, just doing the most. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty loud if you can tell. I talk a lot, so I'd probably fail that test. Three um, boxes. If you don't have them like, Calvin Klein. Whew, that's a relief. I have Calvin Klein boxers on, but little do they know that I got them from Nordstrom Rack on Wholesale. So how's that for a finesse, ladies? If you always come in a t-shirt or undershirt, it's like, where's your shirt at? Uh, all right, so I think I'm gonna fail this test. So let's get back to the video. Thank you, City Girls, for the self-esteem booster. I really appreciate it. They also contacted local rapper and friend Iceberg to ask about using his studio. They were there from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. recording while Iceberg was asleep, and while they were originally worried that he would be too hard on them, they ended up being even harder critics on themselves. The two recorded the track five different times in their cousin's warehouse studio for free before finally finding the version that they would want to promote. The first time we did it, it was so drowsy. They never felt quite confident in the record being perfect, but eventually Miami told JT, look, we gotta just put this out because I'm tired of going to the studio late when I have a child to take care of. Young Miami's son Jay is also adorable on a side note. I think that's probably one of the best thing I ever did was have a baby. It keep me grounded, it give me a purpose. I got something to live for. It also goes to show you that you'll never get anything perfect, but if it's good, it'll rise to the top. So to all my creators out there, just put it out and let it rise instead of worrying about having something being perfect. The City Girls released the song later that month, and just as the song dropped, JT was arrested for credit card fraud. So while she was dealing with that, Young Miami was forced to promote the song solo. She used Instagram and local Miami clubs to get the song heard. She would get girls to sing the song and then repost it to her page, and she would tip DJs at clubs anywhere from $20 to $200 to play their song. The buzz from their song started to get them booked for local shows at clubs like Heads or Tails and G5. At their first show, there was a fight outside and a lot of chaos, but when they finally got inside, people knew their song word for word and they had the club packed. The two were popular in their city already, so they had people who were fans of them, rooting for them to succeed for their neighborhood. Our first show, it was at this club called Heads and Tails. On our way there, it was a big fight. They were shooting, people running. We like, man, we ain't gonna never make it. JT was locked up for a short period of time while the song started to blow up, and she almost lost sight of their vision. Even Miami said she was trying to be an Instagram model at the time and was ready to go down that route if music didn't work. She had 80K followers on her Carisha's collection page where she would sell dresses and wigs. So at the time, I guess it was working out for her. I was trying to get there. Like, I, was, I was almost there. So I was like, you know. <laughs> I How was, you almost get there? Because my followers was getting there. One day she still does hope to design her own fashion collection. 
But when JT got out, the two did a freestyle over D to the A. They recorded a video for their first track and dropped it the following year, even getting Trina and DJ Khaled in the video. Trina gave the two her co-sign in a Hot 97 interview saying this. It just reminded me of me like way back when I came out with Trick. It was just two of them now, but it just reminded me of that same thing. Like they didn't choose this as a career. They regular girls, they're fly, they do their thing. And their rise to fame did happen pretty quickly and unsuspectingly to both. Both of the girls didn't really see rap as a potential career option at the time. But a couple of months later, they met the man that changed it all for them. They got a manager, Stanley Gabert, I think that's how you pronounce his name, to help them steer their career and he steered them in the right direction. He was friends with music industry vet and head of quality control, the same label that has Cardi, Migos, Yachty, and Lil Baby, Coach K. I just did a video on Zion Williamson and Coach K was also the man to change his life, but two different Coach Ks. Anyways, City Girls manager showed their music to Coach and he loved their vibe. So when he was in Miami for BT Hip Hop Weekend, he met them and wanted to help them reach new heights even with JT's pending case. QC and Coach K wanted to sign City Girls to a deal, and at first they resisted and wanted to stay independent, but after talking things over and having QC to agree to let them be themselves, even under their management, they signed a joint deal with Quality Control and Capitol Records 11 months after recording their first song. They hug us tight when they see us. They don't be like, nobody acting more bigger than anybody. Like Yachty, he real down to earth. He help us too. Like. It's a family night. So yeah, things happen pretty quickly. To celebrate the signing, Miami went to the strip club and Coach bought them quality control chains. That's not the only thing that Coach gave the girls though. Coach K actually gave the city girls their name. He was like, I think you girls should be called the city girls because you know y'all from the city of Miami and every man want them a girl from the city. Prior to that, the duo was just going as Young Miami and JT holding their individual rap names. There were some other options like group chat and Twosome? They want to name us Twosome. They want to what? No, our management team wanted to name us Twosome. Over there, Nuki. But apparently, at first, P, the other head of QC, wasn't on the same page as Coach K when it came to the City Girls' music. Cause P ain't feel the City Girls. P, P wasn't feel it. P, P you wasn't no. feeling it in the beginning. P did not understand the City Girls. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he saw the vision and helped them get focused for a run making sure they were in the studio every day recording their debut project. In May of 2018, they dropped their 16 track debut project, period, which includes the songs Take Yo Man, Wear the Bag At, and Give It A Try. But City Girls star really went to new heights when Drake followed them on Instagram and wanted to get them on a record. So we like, please stop playing with us. He was like, I'm serious. He was like, I ain't finna screenshot y'all FaceTime me. He showed us a DM. And we was like, oh my God. We made it. <laughs> the two flew to Atlanta to secretly record the song with Drake, who ended up chopping up their vocals and using it for In My Feelings. Drake was asking Risha and JT if they love him on a song. They got name drops in arguably the biggest song of the year, but it must have been incredibly bittersweet because the song was released 18 hours before JT had to report to prison. JT was locked up for fraud charges and is set to serve two years in Miami's federal detention center. But everyone's hopeful that she'll get out early on good behavior. She said this on Instagram. Did more than I thought I could imagine in this short period of time out on bond. Now it's time for me to knock this down and come back strong forever. Hold my baby down, y'all. I gotta open federal case. I gotta go to jail. As for the future, when JT gets out, the group hopes to be worldwide. They wanna be the next Migos. And Miami told Rolling Stone, 10 years from now, we still wanna be hot, we still wanna be big. And once JT comes home, there's most likely gonna be a City Girls World Tour and some more new music. But as for the rest of the story, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see because this is before they were famous. We make new bios every day on this channel, so be sure to check those out and subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of them. As always, I'm Jeremy Hecht here for you on Before They Were Famous. Dream good, live better. I hope you have one heck of a day. Free JT, and I'll see you in the next video.